or so. All right, so I wanna thank everyone for coming today. Uh, we are gonna go over the Guidewell VR Welding Simulator. We're gonna talk about a bunch of different things today. Again, if you missed it, a few things just to get started. My name is Chris Potapenko. I am a product support specialist here at RealityWorks. I've been with the company over five years now, and um, my specialty really kind of comes into if you've got any issues, you're gonna give us a call or send us an email. And my group is actually the group of people that are going to support you and make sure that everything is working the way it should. Along with that, I get to do these great opportunities of doing webinars, on-site trainings, things like that. So I don't wanna to talk too much about me, take up time here, but let's kind of get into it. A couple things just before we get started here, uh, as this is a webinar, the mic only goes one way, so you're gonna hear me, but I won't hear anything from you. Uh, if you have questions, go ahead and use that questions and answers box at the top of your screen there. Click on that, type in your question, and I'll see that pop up, I'll be sure to answer that along the way. Uh, again, screen settings on your size, if you want to expand the view, certainly go ahead and take advantage of that and do that. So, uh, I don't see any questions as we're getting started here. So, let's just kick off. Today, we're going to talk about uh, the Guidewell VR unit, of course. So, we're going to do a product overview. What comes in the box, what purchasing options you have. We're going to talk about setup and installation. We're going to talk about the hierarchy of accounts inside the software. Um, so what do you do as you log in as an admin or as an instructor uh, or as the student there? We're going to go inside that software and in that virtual welding booth, and I'll show you um, some of the key features in there as well. We'll talk about that curriculum, and then finally we'll wrap everything up uh, going over product support, what we do as far as giving you additional resources for success. Um, we'll talk about these webinars, we'll talk about how we can support you in the future, and then I'll leave you with some contact information as well on how you can reach out to us if there's additional questions that come up out of today's uh, session here. So a couple of things getting started here is the Guidewell VR unit I have on the table right beside me here. Uh, it does come with a base workstation that you see, which is the gray rectangle. It has three welding coupons there, a T-joint, lap joint, and a butt joint. You have the option to either purchase MIG or the stick attachment, or both. They are a removable attachment, and I'll show you a little bit of that later on. It'll come with a pair of welding gloves, uh, the necessary cables to connect to your computer, and then a curriculum that goes along with it as well. That curriculum is really kind of a, uh, an additional benefit, if you will, where we try to put together a piece of hardware, software, and the curriculum to go along with it to help you as an instructor have a complete package in using this product. So we'll take a look at that curriculum and, and give you an overview of that piece as well down the road here. With setup and installation, you really have two options. And this is gonna depend on how many units you've actually purchased. If you're purchasing one, two, three units, using the standalone configuration that we see on the left-hand side of the screen is probably gonna be easy enough for you to get by with. Um, what that entails is that you install the software on a single computer, you plug in one of these units into that single computer, and you're gonna set everything up, your classes, add your students, and have everyone work off of that one computer. When you get to have a few more units involved, you start looking at that multi-user configuration on the right-hand side of the screen. Now the image here shows that you'll need a dedicated server most times your schools already have a server where they're housing information on, so it's just a matter of installing a database file in that location and pointing everything back to it. Again, most times that's already set up. That's how your computers interact across your school's network, um, but we can facilitate the information to get to the IT people to just add what we need to be able to use this software across that scope. The benefit of the multi-user versus that standalone is that, again, with a standalone, you're really a one-to-one -one basis. And if you've got three units, three separate computers, you as the instructor have to set it up three separate times, and then your students have to go to the same computer every time, so when you get their grades, you're looking at each.
Oscar says we do an excellent work at supporting these installations. Well, thank you, Oscar. Um, I may have actually spoke with you and, and, you know, going forward when we do these, that's really our goal is to try to make sure you get it and you're able to use it as we go along here. The multi-user that I was just referring to there, this is the one that I really try to steer people to setting up right out of the, right out of the gate. This allows you to, again, have that centralized database, and then you could have computers with these units connected throughout the school, really, or throughout your network. In this example, you may have one in a welding shop, in your library, and at your desk in your office. So you can log in from your desk, you can view grades there as well versus the previous method of having to log into each individual computer and see those grades. So it looks a little daunting on the screen here. Again, you can give us a call or have your IT give us a call. We'll walk through the installation and make sure that it's up and running. Part of that installation is also going to install this database utility. It's important to point this out here, is that if you want to keep your data year to year, or if you're doing that multi-user setup, you're gonna use this utility to get things going. So a couple of the key things I wanna point out is this database location icon you see in the upper right-hand corner. When you do a multi-user setup, you simply log in to this utility, go into that database location, you're gonna point everything back to it. The other great features here are the ability to back up and restore your database, as well as resetting that admin password should you forget that. Outside of this initial setup, once you have everything set up and running, you won't actually have to log into this utility to do anything. It's just there in case you need it. Um, a couple of the operating systems I just want to point out here is we do test this in-house on all the current uh, operating systems, both Windows and for Apple or Mac OS that you see here. So we do have it running on Windows 10, and um, the newest version of Mac, which is 1012 Sierra, is out there working now. So um, anything you've got from Windows 7 going forward or 10.9 going forward, you're not gonna have an issue running the software. And then finally, the last uh, slightly boring detail here is those system requirements. Uh, the big thing is having a computer that has been manufactured in the last four to five years, that's pretty much gonna be a shoe and it's gonna work. The video card is the, the biggest component here out of the whole thing is making sure that that card is DirectX 10 capable. Uh, what that's gonna provide for you is a smooth operation in the software. Uh, everything on the screen is gonna look fluid, it's gonna look crisp, and, and it's just gonna work that much better for you because this is a video card or video intensive product, I should say. Talking about those hierarchy of accounts next. Inside the GuideWorld VR software, there are three levels, or three account levels, if you will. The top level here is this admin account. Its purpose is for you to sign in and create your instructor accounts and change your units of measurement. So if you use it in an automotive class and you might be doing a lot of things in metric there, um, you can change to metric from standard, so on and so forth. The key thing to point out here again is there's no limits on accounts. So you can have as many instructors set up as you wish. The next level down is the instructor account level. It's right in the middle there. This is where your bread and butter comes into play. You're gonna be spending a lot of time here initially to create your classes, add your students, and then give assignments for those students to complete, and then finally view that student grade. So you as an instructor can log in and you'll do all this at that level. And we're gonna go over some of this when we get into the software here. Again, there are no limits on accounts. So for the GuideWeld VR software, uh, we have no user licenses or seat fees. There's no reoccurring software updates that you have to pay for. Once you've purchased the product, any software updates we have are gonna to come to you free of charge. And if you have a thousand kids or 10 kids, uh, you're able to use this you know, indefinitely, basically. There, there are no restrictions for you on that. So it's an important factor that you know that. And finally, that third level is that student account level. This is where your students log in and they're actually gonna practice those welds, perform tests, and get that immediate feedback and see their grades. All right. 
So doesn't look like there's any questions on these three different tiers here, so we're gonna keep plugging along. Uh, I'm gonna hop inside the software and in that virtual booth next, because I'm gonna go through those levels and show you what they look like in real time. But a couple things I wanna point out, inside that virtual welding booth, you're gonna see these different dexterity guides. This is that benefit that you get with Guide World VR is you get the guided assistance to teach you those basic skill sets of welding. So you're going to have dexterity guides to help you focus on speed, your travel angle, your work angle, your nozzle to plate distance or your arc length if you're doing stick, and your overall straightness. And we'll go through this again in the software, but each of these has either some arrow indicators or plus or minuses along. And all of this is designed to help that user or that student take that corrective action and improve their um, skill sets or hone their skills for welding here. Likewise, once they perform the weld, the student report is something we're going to look at next as well, is this is that immediate feedback they get or their grade on how well they performed that last weld. Whether it's a test or a practice, the report will remain the same. The way we read this is looking at the left hand side, we see work angle, travel angle, plate distance, speed, and overall straightness. It has the, the settings that were put in place by the WPS that we're using for this particular weld. And if we look in the center here, we have a gray band. That gray band is that tolerance level. So right now it's set at a novice difficulty. So as long as our orange line is inside that gray band, you're going to achieve a score of 100%. Any time that the orange line tracks outside of that, that band, we're going to get some points deducted, and that's where we know we need to work on our skill sets here. So in this case, looking at this student's report, their speed was all over the place, and really, if I'm going to go back and practice again, I'm going to start focusing on my speed to make sure I get that skill level up to par as well. So let me go ahead and bring up that software. So what you should see on the screen now is you should see this uh, open options box, if you will, or, or settings box when you launch Guidewell VR. This will come up each time you launch the software. If you're not seeing it on your end, just feel free to shoot me a comment, let me know, and we'll stop and make sure we get that corrected. What you'll see here is you're going to see Guidewell VR at the top in the header, and you're going to see the current version number there, 3194. That's current uh, as of today. You have some options to change language. You have some options to change your screen resolution, set full screen on or off, and then you have some graphic options there at the bottom as well. So talking about resolution, if you're gonna project this up on a whiteboard, or on a TV, uh, on a projector screen, you may need to adjust that resolution to fit the screen that you're showing this on to your students. Likewise, if it's on a monitor, it should auto detect that as well and fill that just nicely. Your graphic options down here, if you have a computer that is a little older and you're seeing some uh, latency running the software, you may have to come in here and drop these settings down and you can go all the way down to fastest. But what that's going to do, it's going to change how uh, clean and crisp everything looks on the screen. It's going to drop those settings down a little bit to allow it to run smoother. If you have a newer computer though, you should be able to run right at fantastic and have no issues. In my case, I do, so I'm going to go ahead and click play here. Once the software loads, what we're going to see on the screen there is that it's checking to see if there's an update. So if your computers are connected to the internet, it'll reach out and say, is there an update or not? If there is, you'll be prompted, do you want to download and install it now? You can choose yes if you have the permissions to install that update or no, and you'll just know that you have to get in touch with your IT to make sure you get that software updated. So to begin with here, I'm gonna log in as my admin user. And to show you what that looks like, right now on the left-hand side of the screen, we have options for touch screen, units of measurement, right now it's set to metric, I can go back to standard here. And you can see I have a whole list of different instructors. Um, because we share this computer in-house for these webinars, I've got a bunch of different instructors set up here. All of those are basically compartmentalized in their own. So if I see I've got my test instructor set up as T1, that's who I'm going to log in as next. 
when you come in and do, set up yours for the first time, you're not going to see any instructors. So you'll simply add a first name and a last name down at the bottom. Click the add welder icon in the bottom right corner and it will add your name to the list here as well. In my case, I've got my T1 instructor. I remember my password so I don't have to reset it. I'm gonna go ahead and back out because the only thing you do at that screen is add your instructor account. Logging in as my instructor, again, which was the T1 one that I've set up, I can see all the classes I've created already. So one question I have coming up already is, is there a difference of instructor or trainee? Um, so if you have, if you have a student teacher, um, you're gonna set yourself up as the instructor there. But if you set them up as an instructor, well, it actually separates it out into complete separate silos. So you won't see what's going on on their end. If you're having, um, you as the instructor and a student teacher with you as well, you give them your credentials to log in so you can work off of it that way. Now as a student coming in, a student is gonna have their own login as well. So while I see this screen set up as my instructor where I can see my classes I've created and I can add students and add assignments, things like that, when a student logs in, they're only gonna see the assignments you give them and they're only gonna see that based on whatever class you put them in in the first place. Absolutely, okay. So I think I got that to the, to the end of that, that scenario there. So the students are added to your class, and I'll show you that in just a moment here. And then the students log in and they're separated out that way. All right, so let me go ahead and create a new class and I'll show you what that'll look like here. So I'll create a class, well, I'll call it testing one. So creating a new class by clicking the add class button, entering in the name here and saving it, we'll put this new class at the top of the screen. What I'll see currently at the top of the screen is that I don't have any students added, I don't have any assignments given to those students, and there are no material savings because we haven't done anything with it just yet. So if I work from the left-hand side here, I'll talk about the archive option here first, and then I'll work my way back across. Archive is if you set up your classes ahead of time, and you have your students in, and you've given them their usernames and passwords to be in with, but you don't want them to start anything until you're ready, you can simply click the checkbox and archive that class. What that does is it moves it down to the bottom of the list. It says that this class is complete and no one can log in or do any assignments on there anymore. Another use for this is at the end of the year, if you're gonna use this same class again next year and you don't want students coming in and doing things, you can simply close that as well. So archiving, close it and locks it from anyone being able to use it. I'll simply uncheck that. It'll put it at the top of my list again as active because that was the last class I created. The next option over is reset. We wanted to give you a few options to eliminate the busy work that you have um, in, in classes oftentimes. So we give you three different reset options here. One is you can delete all the student data for your class. So if you have your class created, you've given them assignments, your students have been logging in and you're just letting them get the feel for it and use it a little bit, but you don't want to count any progress towards their grades. You'll let them use it. You'll come in here. You'll simply click that button and it'll delete all their data. So it'll basically start them out brand new like they've never done a single weld in software. The next option down is you can keep your class and your assignments. Let's say you're going to use this semester, you know, each semester and you're going to have new students you'll simply choose the second option, add your new students in, and you don't have to recreate a class and add all those assignments, it's already done. And the third one deletes everything except the class name, so you'll give new assignments, add new students, and then they'll start recording their data as they go through there. 
So depending on what option best suits you, you have a few options to kind of eliminate that busy work as I was mentioning. Next going across, we have our class name. Class average will populate as they start using it. Shows you as the instructor name here, in my case, T1. Again, we didn't add any students yet, so we don't have any assignments, we don't have material savings. So the next option is to add students. So I've created a class, I'm gonna go ahead and add a student. The add student screen comes up just like this. Uh, at the bottom, it wants you to enter in a first name and a last name and click the add welder icon. So I'm gonna go ahead and see if I can add this. And I did add a student here. Now I've used Jack as a username before, so what it'll do is if you've got students that have the same name, or it turns out to be the same initials in their name, and it comes up the same, it's gonna uh, separate them out by adding a zero one or a zero two after it. In my case, my username is gonna be Jack01, as we see in this third column here. Now, as you get your students populated, there's gonna be a whole list here. If your students uh, leave your class, transfer to a different school, or are just no longer in the program, you can simply come in here, click the student, and go ahead and delete that student. If you delete them, it's gonna just take them out of your class list there. You can reset a student's individual progress as well. So if you've got one student in and they've just been messing around and now they're gonna go ahead for real and get graded, you can come and reset their individual data here as well rather than using a reset option which will do the whole class. And then finally, my favorite is if a student comes in and says, I forgot my password, I guess I can't do anything today, you know, why don't you just let me go do something I wanna do fun, uh, you can come in, reset their password, give them the def default, have them go ahead, log in, and get right back to work. You don't need someone from IT to come in and reset a password. You've got that power right here for you. So I've got my student added. I'm gonna go ahead and click the back button here. Now we can see in the center of the screen number of students in my class. I've got one added. I'm gonna give them something to do, do next. I'm gonna give them some assignments. So I'm gonna click on Edit Class. Under edit class, we have the default assignments on the left-hand side. So we have 27 MIG and 27 stick uh, default weld assignments that are there. And the way we get to that combination is that um, we use a naming convention that we see here. We have three joint types and three difficulty levels and the different gauges of thickness here as well. So if I'm looking at this name at the top in yellow, I'm gonna do a MIG weld. It's gonna be a T joint. I'm gonna work with mild steel. It's gonna be a novice difficulty, and I'm working with 16 gauge. In the center screen, I see a graphic representation of that as well. The weld type is MIG, I'm gonna do a T joint, I'm working with mild steel, 16 gauge, and it's a novice difficulty. So I can see, as I select these, if I choose a different one like a lap joint here, the center screen changes to show me how this default is set up. So I can see my angles that I have set up here as well as my speed and whether I'm gonna do a push or pull. Now all of our default welds are defaulted to a dollar each for that six inch coupon. If you wanna create your own custom WPSs, you're able to do that in the center of the screen here. So if something in your area to do this T-joint cost a couple dollars, you can simply raise the price by clicking on the arrows next to it you're gonna save this because it's now one that you've created custom and you're gonna give it a custom name. But something that's beautiful here as well is we have it set to mild steel. Students have the option to work with stainless steel and aluminum inside the simulator also. You can also choose whether you want to do push or pull as we're doing a MIG welt here. But if we change that to a stick, it is gonna to default to pull only. Changing it back to MIG here. One other thing I wanna point out is a question that comes up often is, does your software have them set up machine settings? You know, setting the amperage, things of that nature. No, it does not. This software is designed to teach those core mechanics of welding. When you get into using our GuideWeld Live unit and you're using your welders inside your shop, 
you're going to teach them how to set up your welders. The reason why that's important for me to note is that uh, I was just at a school. They bought 10 welders. Their serial numbers were sequential right off the line, but they all operated a little bit differently. So even setting them up, I couldn't just go, okay, set the setting to 10, I'll just say, on each one of those machines because the machines welded differently at that setting. So you had to tweak them just a little bit. So in our software, we don't talk about setting up the machine or, or anything of that nature. We just focus on those core mechanics of welding. Now, one other thing you may notice in here is there's an orientation option. We are working on different positional welding, inside, outside corners, vertical pipe welding, things of that nature. The software is, as far as I understand it, is capable to do that. However, we don't have our hardware set up just yet to be able to take that on. It is something we're working on. It's on the roadmap for the future. So just be aware that that, that should be coming and uh, look for that in the future. At this point, I'm gonna select a couple welds to do here. One is gonna be this T-joint. So I'm gonna just simply click the plus symbol on the right-hand side of it. And you'll notice it puts it underneath our class assignment list on the right-hand side of the screen. I'm gonna grab an advanced one as well. Again, still T-joint just to show you a difference between novice and advanced when we get to it. And then finally, I'm gonna go ahead and grab a stick weld here in a T-joint also. So that way we can bring that up inside the software. I've got three welds added for my class to do. At this point, I'm gonna click the back button. And I'm back to my class listing the screen here, the initial screen you log into and see as an instructor. So now I can see in my class that I've got one student, I've got three assignments for them to do, and at this point, I don't have anything else to do here. I'm not gonna add any more students, I'm not gonna get any more assignments. So the next step is to really log in as that student and then begin doing a MIG weld and show you what that looks like. So I'm gonna click the exit door in the bottom left here. I'm back at the login screen. Again, my username was Jack01. And the first time a student logs in, that default password is what they're gonna need to use. So the default password is gonna be the word password. Once I enter that, I'll simply click login. It prompts the student to change that password to something else that they're choosing. I'm going to just put in 123ABC for simplicity's sake and go in and click save. So now I'm logged in as my student. I'm logged in as Jack. And we can see that in the upper uh, header of the screen here. I'm logged in with today's date. Now there is a little welder icon here. If I click on that, it's going to bring me up to a screen where I can change my password to something else if I want to do that. But I can also change my handedness. So if Jack was left-handed, I could switch this to left and go ahead and save that. But I'm right-handed, so I'm gonna keep that the way it is. I'm gonna simply just click the back button because I didn't make any changes in here. So as a student, I can see that here are three new assignments. They're indicated as such by the color orange and the word new. I can see the assignment details or those WPS details in the center of the screen, so I know kind of what I'm gonna be expected to do. So this middle one is a T-joint, it's gonna be novice difficulty. I'm gonna work on that one first. You'll see my only option here is to do a practice. Test is locked and so is the report function here. A student must practice and achieve a score over 40% before the test function is unlocked. The test function will be unlocked and you'll see there's an orange uh, circle here with the number five the student is currently allowed to take the test five times. That is something in the software. We did get feedback saying, you know, as an instructor, I'd like to be able to change the percentage that they get before test unlocks. And I'd also like to be able to change the number of times they can take that test. So we do have that feedback. As far as I know, they are working on getting that implemented in the software. But if you want them to take it one time, just know that each time they take the test, that counter will tick down. So when you go look at it, you should see that they have four remaining, knowing that they've only taken it one time. At this point, I'm gonna go ahead and click practice, 
and it's going to take me inside that virtual welding booth. As we come in, we're putting the gloves on, we're going to bring down the hood or the shield for the mask there. Again, we want to stress that safety. We don't have anything physically that the students are wearing for safety other than the gloves that came with it. I do have some instructors though, however, we'll have them wear um, their leathers, jeans, boots, anything appropriate that they would in their shop. And they give them a hood with a clear face shield in it so that they have to dress appropriately using this as well. Again, it's not needed. However, that's something else that you can use at your discretion if you choose. Now that I'm in this booth, the first thing that it wants me to do is it wants me to attack the left side of plate as shown. Um, so I'm gonna stop sharing this screen here just so I can show you the full screen on the monitor of what I'm doing in the physical world here. So on that software, it wants me to attack the left side as shown. So I grab my mid gun here. I'm gonna come up and I'm gonna press tight against this coupon on the vertical and horizontal joints there. My nozzle is at a 45 degree angle, and I'm half on and half off the coupon. The easiest way to do this is there is a seam that runs down the center of this MIG gun. Line that up with the edge of your coupon, have that 45 degree angle in place there, and simply pull the trigger and release. Once you do that, the software is going to ask you to tack the right side of plate as shown. So I turn a little bit more here. I'm going to do the same thing on the right side. Simply line it up, 45, touching both the vertical and horizontal piece, pull the trigger, and release. So when I hop back into the software now, what you will see is we're actually ready to begin welding. So inside the software, since I've tacked, I'm now able to move and begin welding. So a few things, again, we're going to talk about on screen are those dexterity guides. So if I can do this without giving anyone motion sickness, you'll see that if I tilt or rotate my wrist in the upper left and right hand corners, there are going to be some arrows. These arrows are directing me to get into proper welding position once again. You'll also see on the nozzle of the MIG gun, that there is an arrow there as well. If I'm too far away, it's gonna position me back in place by saying come closer. Also on the screen, we've got the green plus symbol. That's gonna be our speed indicator. As we weld, we're gonna see that change. It's gonna give me corrective actions to slow down or speed up. Now, all of these guides that are in the software are there for your use to hone those skill sets. If you're working on something and you realize, I just really need to focus on my speed, or you could say, I've got everything else down and my speed is great, I wanna focus on something else. In the bottom left, each of these orange squares are little buttons where you can turn off certain dexterity guides. The student will still be graded on them, however, they won't show up on the screen. So for instance, if I toggle off the speed, you'll just notice that that speed indicator goes away. And if I move my gun, everything else is still functioning. I'm just not getting that assistance for speed. So this is great. So as a student progresses and they say, I've got this covered, they can turn those off and make sure that they're just getting that muscle memory down and that simulated arc time. And they're just holding that skill set to the point where they don't even need those dexterity guides anymore. And they're ready to take that test and get a great score on it. The other thing I will mention is just like in the physical world, any viewing angle or position angle that you have, you can accomplish in this virtual world. So I can rotate and pan or zoom in or zoom out just by simply holding the left mouse button and removing my mouse or holding a right mouse button and moving it. I can do the same thing by using the camera control buttons at the bottom of the screen here as well. At this point, I'm in a good position. Um, I want to weld here, so I'm going to go ahead and pick up my MIG gun. I'm going to come in, and since I'm right-handed, I'm going to do a push here. I'll get into position. I'll simply pull that trigger and begin welding. Now, as I weld, if I get out of position or start uh, tilting my wrist down, you're going to see all these different guides change. 
if I were in proper position at some point, the gun would glow gold. I didn't get it that time. It's hard to talk and move and, and do this at the same time. But there is something called the golden gun inside the software here. And we'll see if we can get that to come up at some point. That's some positive reinforcement for your students to say, you've got all those angles right. You're going the correct speed. Keep it up. You're doing a great job. But at this point, I've done my weld. As ugly as it looks, I'm going to go ahead and save that so I can see what my immediate feedback is. So here's my grade for that practice. So again, it shows at my work angle, um, I was in tolerance here, and then I started getting out, so I got docked. I'm down to 90% here. Same thing with speed. You can see that I'm going too slow, too fast, and it's varying all over the place. So I was docked several points there as well. The remaining three there show, however, that I stayed within that gray band of tolerance for that novice difficulty, so I did get 100%. Overall, these five scores are averaged out, so I get my overall score for this practice, which is 88%. Now there's a video replay option here as well, so if I wanna look at this, then watch that weld being done again, I can do that. And then over time as I practice, there'll be a history graph here. And this is used to show how I've progressed over time. Now one thing that's really great for virtual reality or any type of simulator is that in the traditional sense, if you were teaching someone to weld in your shop, you would have them grab a couple pieces of steel, <coughs> excuse me, they'd go tack, they'd set up, they'd do their weld, they'd go quench, they'd get in line, they'd try to get um, your opinion on how well they did. You're going to tell them you did great on this, you need to work on that, adjust your angle here, adjust your speed, maybe turn your machine a little bit. They're going to go back, maybe they can reuse that steel, maybe they can't. they got to scrap it, grab two more pieces, and then do another well. Well, by that time, they may or may not remember where they were at in position with their muscle memory. They may or may not remember what you just told them was right or wrong about their last well. So you lose a lot of time in that traditional sense. With this, I did a weld, I saw my grade, I can reflect on it, I can click the back button, and I'm right back at the, the assignment screen, where I can simply click practice and go right back in and do another weld. So if I set this up again, I'm gonna tack both sides. I'm ready to do a weld, I'm gonna keep it right where it is this time, and I'm gonna go ahead and do it. We got that golden gun saying everything's in proper position. Great job. Keep it up. Usually for me at this point, I screw something up like I just did. But I'll go ahead and finish this out anyways. I got the weld done. All right, I want to see my grade. I simply click the save button. I'm right back on this report. I see how I did. Again, click back, and you're right back doing it again. So the amount of simulated arc time you have in your classroom now triples easily. Um, I've had some instructors say, well, I have students now that can do 20, 30 welds because they can just rotate through them constantly, and it's telling them what they did right or wrong. They don't have to sit in line and wait for me and set everything up. So I've done a novice difficulty here. I want to show you the advance just to show you the difference. So I'll click on practice for my advanced. I'm going to go ahead and tack just like I did before. And as I go ahead and do the weld, I still have all those different dexterity guides in play here. Work angle, travel angle, distance. But I'll go ahead and get one across there. And you can already see that it's much tighter tolerances here but you'll really notice this in the report. So you can see right away, if I'm looking at work angle at the top here, where novice difficulty had this great big one inch band going across there, when I get to it advanced, it's expecting me that I have honed my skills, I've got the muscle memory, and I'm really tight on what I'm doing and making sure I'm doing a great job with it. So here, there's very little margin for error which is what we want. We want them to advance beyond someone who's green and never welded 
to be able to get into your shop and start doing a weld on, on those machines and have some of that muscle memory behind them. So any questions on the MIG welding at all? I'm not seeing any pop up. So once I've done a practice and I've achieved that score, you'll notice that the test has unlocked. Now the test, if I click on that to go in there, the setup is exactly the same as it was for practice. So we keep things consistent for students. So everything is simple and it's the exact same thing every time. We'll come in and we'll tack both sides. But the difference with test is you're gonna notice right away, there are no dexterity guides on the screen. We're expecting that they're gonna have that muscle memory, they're gonna have that skill set, and we wanna see how they're doing with this particular weld. So I'm gonna zip one across here. No matter what I do, there's no help as far as what I should be doing. But once I complete that weld, I'll click save, just like I did in practice. The report looks identical for a test as well. And what we see is the same information. Here's what we're being graded on. The center is how I did. Here's my individual scores to tell me what I need to practice. In this case, it is speed. Here's my overall score. So we've kept things very uh, simple and consistent between practice and test. The big difference is there are no dexterity guides for test. It really is just testing your skill sets at that point in time. So what we can see now on the screen as a student, I've got one assignment I didn't do anything with at the top, it's brand new. I've got one assignment that's blue, it says I'm able to take the test, that means I've done a practice, test is now unlocked for me. And I've got one in green saying I've done a practice, I've done my test, and I'm done, I did my assignment. So this is how students know what they need to, to work on or what they're done with. Now in any of these, at any point in time, if they wanna go back and practice again, it still allows them to practice an unlimited amount of times. So at this point, if I've done these two MIG welds and I wanna do a stick weld, the next thing to do is actually to switch out the hardware. If a student clicks on practice for a stick weld, but they have the wrong hardware attached, it's going to give them a simple error message saying, oops, this is a stick weld. Here's what you need to do to swap out your attachment. You simply turn the power off on the unit. You turn the collar at the front of the unit to detach the MIG gun. I'm going to go ahead and set this one back here. I'll grab my stick one next. I'll line it up. And if you use yours a little bit, you're going to notice that there's a little paint pen mark. Those two dots line up. Turn the collar, it clicks right in place. Simply turn the power button on. You give it a few moments to recognize new hardware's attached, just like you would do if you're plugging in a mouse to your computer. <coughs> Once it recognizes that, you'll come and click practice, and it takes you right back into that virtual booth once again. So one question by Deanna is, uh, is the stick more difficult? Uh, it is, it is. Most times um, when I talk with uh, instructors, when they're teaching someone to weld, they actually start them out with stick to begin with. Um, because what they've told me, and, and this is, was the same for me when I was learning, is MIG is easier. Once you've done MIG, most people don't wanna deal with stick. They both have their applications, they both have their purposes, and they both have their needs. Um, but for a student, depending on the grade level you're in as well, um, if you give them the easy route, they're gonna complain about something being more difficult down the line. So if you start them off with stick and teach them how to do that, by the time you get to MIG, they'll be like, well, this is super easy. So it is a little more difficult, but it's difficult because of what's required when you do the well. You know, with MIG, you're pulling a trigger, that wire's being fed continuously, and you're laying down your bead, pushing that puddle out, and you're good to go. With stick, you've got an electrode that consumes itself. It doesn't reload automatically. So not only are you moving horizontally across your, your um, seam there, laying down your bead,
but you're having to move in at an angle as well as you consume that electrode. So there's a little bit more motion to that to get used to, to build that muscle memory as well. So I've got stick attached here. We're in that welding booth. The first thing you see in that little black box is it wants me to pick up the rod holder. So when I pick that up, what this does is it's got a motor inside. It's resetting the electrode to its uh, brand new state, if you will. Once I have a new electrode in place with the hardware here, it wants us to tack the left side as shown. Now this is a little different. You know, in an actual welding booth with uh, a rod, you're not gonna go ahead and press a button or anything else like that. But for our software and hardware, that's exactly what you have to do. So you're gonna line it up like we did with that MIG gun. That electrode's gonna be at that 45 degree angle, and it's gonna be touching right along the edge of that coupon here. Now I use my finger to hold it in place here, and I push the tip of the electrode right against my finger so I know it's on the edge. When you're in position, you simply push the orange button on top of the rod holder and release. When you do that, it's gonna go over to the right-hand side, and we're gonna do the same thing. Line up, press the orange button, and release. Now in my case, if I wasn't in proper position, which I wasn't, you can get an error message that shows there's a possible minor interference, or you've tacked incorrectly. Now it's worth noting that when you tack, both for MIG and stick, what it's actually doing is it's calibrating the hardware to the software. So what it's doing is, is the more accurate you are when you tack, the more accurate the weld recording is gonna be for that student. So at this point, once I've tacked, it's the same thing we saw with MIG. Everything is fluid and movable on the screen. We have our different dexterity guides, upper right hand, left hand corner, our speed. Um, we also have the arc length guide on the end of the electrode. Now the thing that's different here is with MIG, I could do a push or a pull. So with push, I'm pushing that puddle forward and building that out. But with stick, I need to drag or pull. So being right-handed, I'm gonna start from the left-hand side this time, and I'm gonna drag across to the right. So I'm gonna get in position here. I'm gonna begin doing that weld, and you'll see that it wants me to go ahead and slow down. When you're in proper position, the rod holder and electrode will glow gold as well. When you get out, though, you're also gonna get noted those dexterity guides coming up, telling go faster, go slower, getting closer, get farther away, any of those things come into play. Now for this particular weld, I didn't consume my entire electrode. If you create a custom WPS and you may use thicker steel, it's possible you'll use your whole electrode. So there are a couple buttons at the bottom that I wanna point out here. Uh, in the bottom center of the screen, you've got a rod holder and two electrodes. Should you consume yours and need to reload it, you can simply click that button. Animation's coming up. We're just replacing the electrode on screen, but it's resetting the hardware in my hand here as well. So it's fully extending that rod. Likewise, if you consume that electrode entirely, you'll get a message that'll pop up on the screen saying this electrode's been consumed. Click the reload button and the same thing will occur. At this point, I've laid down my bead here. The next thing to do is to hit my chipping hammer, brush it clean so I can actually see what I did. So in the bottom right corner, we got the little hammer icon here. Simply go ahead and click on that. And then this is just another animation. In your shot, your students are gonna be doing this. So we wanted to add an animation to show this is another step you have to do with stick welding. Once it's clean, we got all the slag off of there, we're gonna go ahead and click the Save button, and we're right back to the same report that we're used to seeing. Left-hand side shows us what we're graded on, center of the screen shows us how we did, right hand shows us what our overall score was. So again, consistency between MIG, stick, practice, or tests.
Any questions about inside the software, inside the, the virtual booth here? I'm not seeing any come up here. If they do come up, we'll certainly get those addressed there. But for a student right now, that is it. So I've done my practice, I've done my tests, I've got my grade here, I can see. So I get that immediate assessment of how I did in my practice. I know what I need to work on. I see the immediate grades from me doing the test, so I don't have to wait for the instructor to grade my material and you know, physically say this was right or this was wrong. Everything happens right away for that student. And it's quick, so they can go right back in and continue to do more practice and get that simulated arc time, hone in those muscle memory, and build that skill set. So if I log out of my student, the last thing I just want to show you is I'm going to log back in as my instructor. So from your desk, once your students have been using it, this is what you can see again. So we got our testing one class at the top. Um, I've done five welds that cost a dollar, so I've got a material savings of five dollars. Over time, that's going to add up through all of your students. You can see class reports here, which is one thing we didn't talk about before. So overall, you can see all the assignments you've given to your class, and you can see their average scores for each of the assignments you've given them. So in this case, I've only had one student do that. So I see I've done this assignment three times. They were each a dollar, so I know that. One for here and one for there. Now, the class average shows the test score here. I didn't do a test on these other assignments. So right now, the test class average score is 80%. This is great because if you get a class of 15, 20 kids, you can get a snapshot of how much you've saved in materials, and you can get a snapshot of how they're doing on these assignments. So if you see a particular assignment that your students are struggling with, you know that they all need to work on that a little bit more and you might give them a couple more assignments that are in that same ballpark. If we click the back button here, the next link over is student reports. If you have multiple students, they'll show up on the left hand side. You simply highlight the student you want to see in orange, and here's that student's individual progress. So you see the class average compared to their score, and here's where you can see their individual report as well. So as an instructor, you're logging in, you can see how my student Jack did, and I can say, well, great, he did this assignment, he got an 80%, but he really needs to work on his speed. He was too fast the whole way along. Maybe I'm gonna give them more assignments to do and just see how they do with that speed. So really, as an instructor logging into your uh, instructor account here, you have full control to set up the class, add your students, give them assignments, create custom WPSs if you want, view their reports as well, and then you can print those out or you can save them, but your students are gonna know right away what they got after they do their tests. All right, so that is inside the Guidable VR software. The next thing I'm gonna share with you here is we're gonna talk about the curriculum a little bit. And I know we're getting close to time here, but I only have a few things left because we got through all the heavy work here. The curriculum for Guidewell VR is really set up in three units. So the first unit is gonna talk about welding careers, types of welding, safety, things of that nature. The second unit gets into equipment, basics of welding, and weld defects. Again, teaching someone to weld is really half the battle. Teaching them to identify those defects and what to do to correct them is kind of the next step there as well. And then the third unit introduces them to the Guidewell VR simulator. So our curriculum is really designed to be a complete teaching tool. So we set up the teacher guides with presentations here to provide your students, student note sheets, quizzes, tests, and then we provide you the full answer keys as well. If you do not have the links to download the curriculum or view that, or have lost that, just let us know and we can get those to you as well. An additional piece of curriculum is gonna be this welding career exploration. Uh, this was an added piece that we put out there. Uh, oftentimes, you know, students aren't familiar with what types of jobs they could get with their skill sets out there. So this is just some additional information that shows, hey, here's some other jobs you could do as a welder. You could be an engineer, you could be an inspector, 
Uh, you could be pipe welder or uh, do production or fabrication, any of those things. So it's something you can go through with them in the classroom, or if you've got time where you break them out into groups, have them take a look at this in their own time. Just wanted you to be aware that that's still available free for you guys as well. Added bonus, if you will. The last pieces here are if you run into a bind or have questions, who do you call or how do you get a hold of us here? So a couple things that you can do is you can go to our website, uh, realtorworks.com slash support slash guy will VR shown at the top there. Um, we have support videos out there, documents, software downloads, different guides as well. Everything I've talked about today here, I've broken out into short little video segments for you also. One of the other questions that came up was, um, is there a plan for TIG or for Plasma there? I believe it was Plasma there. Um, right now, there has talk about it. Um, I know it's something that they've gotten some feedback for, but I don't have a timeline as far as one that might be coming out. So uh, keep an eye on it for sure. Uh, send us an email with those requests if there's things that you're wanting to see. That's another big piece of working with us and support is the feedback you give us is what we take and move forward to our product managers, to our engineer team to say, hey, this is what people want or this is what people need to have improved upon. So it's very important to us and we really do take that to heart. So that same website, you can reach us by email on the website as well. You can give us a phone call. But again, everything we talk about today, I got in short little video segments for you out there. So you can always go and get a refresher from that video series as well. Our contact information is there again. Product support at realityworks.com is our email address. You can give us a call. We're open Central Standard Time, 730 to 5. Um, we can do different types of support. We can do webinar-based support. We can do remote access um, and work with you over the phone just by itself there. So we've got a, a bunch of different tools in our tool belt to make sure that everything's working for you. The last couple things I want to talk about is this webinar, as well as past webinars, are available on our website for you to view. Um, those webinars are going to be there um, until they're replaced down the line here. So you'll see those come up. Again, if there's someone here that you think should watch this, have them go out there. But again, we're going to send you an email link to the webinar and also an email link with this PowerPoint in there as well. So you'll have these slides, you'll have um, the video link for this webinar, and then you'll have the access to our support site also. So that is it for today. Um, again, if you've got questions, certainly email us, either product support at realityworks.com or information at realityworks.com. Both of those will get to us here. Um, again, it, it's my pleasure to spend some time with you. I can't thank you enough for taking time out of your busy day. Um, it, it means a lot to us, but again, if you've got feedback or you've got questions that go beyond this, make sure you get that to us. I'll answer it or one of my other colleagues will be able to answer you right away. And we're very prompt with that as well. We take pride in being able to get you answers within, you know, usually within that hour, if not within the next few minutes of the time you send that to us. But we have a strict, you know, within one day, you're going to get an answer from us. And as a company, we want to make sure that not only do you receive this product, it works for you, and we can make it the best possible product that you want from us as well. So, again, thank you for your time today, and um, have a great afternoon.